Uh, good morning, everyone. We will just wait for a few minutes to allow for more participants to log in, and then we will start. Now, so good morning, everyone. I hope that you're all doing well. And welcome to this second webinar where we will uh, discuss uh, the key concepts for the different fuels. Uh, so for coal, oil, natural gas, renewable and electricity for energy statistics. And today I'm with Taylor Morrison who works on uh, Africa Energy Data and she will help with the any questions you might have. So don't hesitate to send us any questions you have in the Q&A box. So this is the agenda for, uh, for the training. So today we are doing the second session on statistics by commodity. And uh, before we start with the training, let's quickly do some housekeeping rules. So uh, in order to make our session the most effective. So the whole session is, is, uh, the whole session is virtual. We recommend that everyone uh, turn off their microphones uh, in order to avoid background noises. And if you have any urgent uh, clarification, you can either raise your virtual hand or write down any question you have for us in the Q&A box. After each uh, presentation, there will be a question and, and answer session. Um, and, uh, and so uh, if you have any other questions, you can also write to, to me, to Darlene, or to the Africa program directly. So if we look at the OECD region, we see that 80% of the energy mix is made of fossil fuel. But if we move to Africa, we see that it is only uh, 50%. And, uh, and biofuels and waste account for a much bigger share, which of nearly 50% uh, given hydro, nuclear, solar, etc., is minimal. Now, if we move to sub-Saharan Africa, we see that uh, it's even the share of biofuels increase even more. And it's around 70% for Sub-Saharan Africa. And if we look at Rwanda now, it's even more and accounts for 75% of the energy mix. So you can see that different regions have different um, energy sources. And in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, biofuels uh, represent a very big share. Next slide, yeah. So <clears throat> now let's uh, see quickly how data are collected and where they come from. So what are our sources? For supply and transformation data, uh, the data for energy industries, producers, importers, and exporters comes mainly from administrative data and through surveys. Regarding demand data, so for energy consumers, we have end use surveys for household and enterprises. And if we want an integrated approach, then we can use existing surveys, direct measurement, estimation and modeling tool. So integrated approach, it's where you use different sources in order to capture all the available data. So uh, this is uh, today's agenda. So at the end of this webinar, you will learn about the key trends, uh, key concepts and key points for data reporting for the different fuels. So we will first look at primary and secondary oil products. Then we will look at natural gas, coal and coal products, renewables and electricity. Before we uh, start the presentation, let us quickly do some uh, Menti questions. So can you start connecting to www.menti.com? And I will do the same here. Where's my Menti slides? Oh, wait, I'm trying to find my Menti. Okay, if I do new share. Not this one. Okay, found it. So 
<coughs> please connect to www.menti.com and use the code that appears up here. So 7449, uh, 76 and 20. I will also put it in the chat box here. So www.menti.com and the code is 7449 76 and 20. So please connect to menti.com and use the code 7449 76 and 20 to answer the first question. So the first question is how imports of combustible fuels are taken into account in energy statistics? So you have three possible answers. Is it every time a product enter a country, even if just only in transit, it's considered as imported? Is, is it when imports are taken into account only by the country of final destination? Or imports of statistics are based on future contracts of energy commodities? So for combustible fuels, how will you report it? In which case will you report it in energy statistics? Will you report it every time that a product enters the country, even if it's just for transit? Or will you only take into account imports by country of final destination or imports uh, of future contracts also should be reported? Think about it. What do you report in your energy statistics? <clears throat> so we have three participants that have replied. Um, uh, imports should be taken in, on, into account only by the country of final destination. So I'll just give you some more time to think about it. So for those who have just joined, uh, uh, please connect to www.menti.com and um, use the code that appears on the screen uh, to answer the first question. Uh, this is the second question. So let's look at the correct answer. So you all got it right, excellent. So uh, in energy statistics, you should only report imports uh, by the country of final destination for combustible fuels. You will see in the presentation that for electricity, there is some uh, a different um, uh, reporting where you can also include transits, but uh, you will see this in more details in the presentation. So next question, what can we consider as refinery inputs? So is it only crude oil? Should you report, uh, it, it include as refi refinery inputs crude oil and natural gas liquids? Or is it crude oil, natural gas liquids, and any other products of fossil and bio origin? So think about a refinery. You have some input and some output what do you put uh, so what do you feed into the refinery as input what different products can you put in a refinery to be processed so I don't know how many people are familiar with um, the refinery process, but think of a refinery transformation. You have some inputs, some outputs. So as input, what are the possible products that you can put in a refinery? So we have five participants who have replied and three that thinks that you can 
put crude oil, natural gas liquids, and other products of fossil and bio origins. So let's look at the right answer. So the right answer, uh, the majority got it right. So in a refinery, you can put crude oil, natural gas liquids, and other products of fossil and bio origins as input to your refinery. We will look uh, in the presentation uh, on oil um, at this more closely. Now let's move to the presentation. This presentation will be uh, will be in five parts for the for each of the main classification of our energy uh, commodities, and for each of those parts, we will see first the key trends, then the key concepts, and finally some key points for data reporting. And this will be done for primary and secondary oil products, natural gas, coal, and coal products. Of course, for this part, we will go quickly since it is coal is not energy community used a lot in on the African continent. And then we discuss renewables and electricity. So let's start by discussing some primary and secondary oil products energy statistics. So first of all, let's have a look at the crude oil production by countries. And this production is dominated by 10 major uh, producers who represent more than 70% of the global demand. And among those 10, we have three uh, key actors that represent a third of this demand. So uh, an energy landscape in that situation that is far from equally uh, repartied around the globe. Here we are talking about crude oil, but this is not the only part of those, uh, these uh, categories. We also discuss about refined oil products, secondary oil products. So if we have a look now at the world refinery intakes, we can see that although OECD uh, demand, uh, OECD refinery intakes, sorry, stayed more or less stable in times, we have a, an important growth of refinery activities in several non-OECD regions, such as China, Asia, Middle East. This growth shows a growth in the oil demand in those countries of the need for the population of specific oil products. And as we can see on the right, China and all of the other non-OECD regions grew in terms of oil demand in those countries. It is not that visible on this graph on the right, but Africa also knew in the last decade an important growth in its oil demand. So let's have a closer look. In these graphs, you can see pretty clearly that transport has been the sector that drove the, uh, mo the, the most the uh, oil demand in Africa for the last 30 years. Road transportation has grew a lot in uh, those last decades and hence the demand from, uh, the, for oil products. But it's not only that. We have also a growth in aviation fuel due to increased air traffic and also some marine fuel demand that grew due to the increased activity in several ports and uh, port terminals in Africa. Do not forget that transport might be the biggest one, but we have all of those sectors that grew also in terms of demand, such as industries in a later way, residential and non-energy use, which is still in a minor in Africa, while it represented a high share of demand now in OECD countries. So now that we discussed some key trends, let's have a look at how, at how we classify our products, uh, those products in our methodology. So we, distinct, we try to distinguish between the products that feed the refinery and the product that comes out of the refinery. So primary oil products, which are coming from natural resources and 
uh, Finnish secondary oil products which are manufactured in the refinery. This is a growth of uh, definitions, of course, because we have some of the output of the refinery that will be used later on as input of refinery. So this will get a little bit more complex later on. Just remember that those products can be classified in many ways. Also for the Finnish secondary oil products, due to the fact that they are sold products, the name most of the time comes with a specific set of physical properties. Please, if you have doubts on how to report a specific product, do not hesitate to refer to the IRS, so the International Recommendation for uh, Energy Statistics from the United Nations. This is the methodology that we are following at the IEA and that is followed by most of the international organizations. So to discuss it a bit more in detail, in primary oil products, you will find crude oil and natural gas liquid, liquids, for example, coming from uh, oil wells or natural gas fields. But you can also find some synthetic crude oil, which we'll discuss a little bit later, uh, and some secondary products as inputs to the refinery, additives and feedstocks, for example. On the other end of the refinery, we will see some, first of all, some gases, some refinery gases that are part of the process, and then all of the products that we can find on the market today, such as naphtha, gasoline, diesel, fuel oil, lubricants, bitumen, and in our statistics, we try to focus on the uh, products that will, the quantity of those products that will be used for energy uses, of course. So now let's have a look at how we, uh, repre we could represent the, sh the chain of flows for each product. So let's first, the primary oil products. The refinery in TETS is mostly crude oil, but as I also told you before, it can be also include, it can also include some other primary and unfinished secondary oil products. But let's keep it simple for now. We focus on the indigenous production of crude oil and some other sources for natural gas liquids, for example. One note here, we focus in our methodologies on marketable productions, onshore or, or, or offshore, but marketable production coming from within the border of the other country. If it's coming from another country, it will be reported as trade, so imports or exports. Then we can have also some stocks, some uh, crude oil that have been kept in waiting for the demand to, for appropriate demand to be used in the refinery. And then we have other flows of consumption uh, and, and uh, supply such as the direct use of primary products. Crude oil can be sometimes used, for example, to generate electricity. And we have some back flows and finished products that are transferred to be, in, to be used as input to the refinery. Just a note on the back flows here, it represents the feedbacks from the petrochemical industries. We do not, we will not detail more here, but this is a part of the old statistics that can be kind of complicated if we look in, more in a more closer way. So now on the other end of the refinery, we have our refinery that will provide the growth in non deliveries of secondary oil products. But to sustain its activity, most of the time, the refinery burns some of its own uh, production. So refinery fuels uh, will be consumed within the refinery to sustain its own activity. Then we have the refinery growth output, so the outputs of, let's say, motor gasoline or diesel from the refinery, which will be part of the growth in the delivery, and the primary product recipe receipts. So for example, as I said before, the crude oil that will be used to be burned in a power plant to generate electricity. We can have then some products, so products transferred to be used as primary uh, so oil products in the previous slide, and inter-product transfers. Those transfers will be, for example, uh, some specific uh, uh, oil, re refined oil products that will be used as 
another product with another uh, other properties. Then, of course, we can have some trades of both products, so imports and export from outside, outside of the countries, and international bunkers. So here we report all of the uh, fuel consumptions for airplanes or uh, maritime ways that concerns uh, trips that originated or are going outside of the countries that are not staying from within the, the country. And again, we can have here also some studs of both products for safety reasons, for commercial reasons, for many, many possible reasons. The gross inland deliveries will be uh, provided for energy sector use, for transformations, and for finite and non-energy consumptions. Now let's have a look at a complete, at a complete oil data sets to hinder some important trades for Sub-Saharan Africa. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, in general, we can find countries that produce a lot of primary oil products, so crude oil, NGL, etc. So the production that is there. But since the capacities, the activities of refinery is very low in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have very few importations of uh, those primary oil and a vast majority that is exported, that is exported toward other countries that will uh, that uh, who will do the activity of uh, uh, ref uh, refined those uh, primary products. So this high level of export I told you shows the lack of capacities in refining. And then if we have a look at the oil products, we can see that the countries are mostly dependent on the importations of the secondary oil products to provide the, the demand of the population for mostly transportation here. As I told you, the refining capacity do not cover the regional demands. Hence, the real reliance on imports that we can immediately see with our statistics. So, if we have a look on how we uh, can try to check our data and make sure our data makes sense, one of the main things that we are paying, at, paying attention to is the transformation efficiency. Ah, the transformation efficiency. When you take any transformations, here we will be focusing on refinery, we check the outputs and the intakes of the refinery. Those are the two main elements that we have in terms of data. So we take these intakes and these outputs, and we try to see if uh, the losses that occurred during the transformations made sense or not, if the value of the losses that we see. Attention here, uh, we, we speak about a refinery losses when the intake is superior to the output and refinery gains when the intake is inferior to the output. And we calculate the yield of this refinery by doing some simple uh, calculation. We divide the output of total secondary products by the intake of total primary products and we, apply, we put it in as a percentage. So we say that there are losses in the refinery if the yield is below 100% and gains if it's above 100%. Of course, here, if you do this calculation, you need to have everything at the same units and units matters in this case. Because in mass units, you would expect some small losses and no gains at all. You do not create mass during uh, uh, such transformations. In energy units, it's the same. Due to evaporations, you would lose in total so a little bit of the carbon content, so of the energy contained in those products. But in volumes units, if you calculate, for example, in the liters or cubic meters, you would expect some slight gains because the products, the secondary oil products that you are creating in your refinery are lighter and occupy more volumes at the end of the refinery process. 
Now, if we discuss about the final consumption of those old products, as I told you, they, those products have specific properties, specific physical and chemical properties, and for this reason, we expect them to have a specific use, a specific final consumption sectors in which we expect them to be. Of course, there can be exceptions in some countries, in some cases, but those in that case needs to be documented and explained in your statistics. So here are some examples. Crude oil, as I told you, can be used in electricity plants, but we have also fuel oil and diesel that are most of the time used for this. In aviation, you would expect jet kerosene or aviation gasoline. Transportation, of course, we would expect gasoline, diesel, LPG, and etc. You, you can see here some main uses, maybe one point on non-energy uses. Those, this part, we still record it uh, for accountability, and bitumen is mostly used, for example, in the creations of worlds. This is the last part, this is the end for our discussion in, uh, on oil products. Now let's talk about natural gas and let's start with some key trends on these products. So natural gas, as no, is the fossil fuels that grew the most in the last, uh, last decades. Its largest producers are now USA and Russia. And its demand grew almost tripled since, since 1973. And it's mostly due to, of it, uh, for its large demand in heat and power production. Its uh, trade is both in gaseous for, form through pipelines and in LNG forms uh, so liquefied uh, forms through tankers, which explain partly its big increase in demand in the latest years because of uh, its ease now to transport this commodity around the world. But it's not the only reason. The main reason is that natural gas is the fossil fuels that emit the less, uh, the less CO2 per unit burned. It's around 60% of coal, for example which explains its interest for many countries to use this fossil fuel to reduce their carbon footprint while doing their green energy transitions. And as I told you, the dominance of pipeline trade has been decreasing since the emergence of liquefied te liquefying technologies, which help bring this fossil fuel into other countries. Now, let's have a look at uh, Africa situations. So global demand for gas doubled since 1990, but in the case of Africa, it's almost quadrupled in the same period. It still represents only 4% of the global demand, uh, of the global demand, but still the growth is very impressive when we see it. This growth as for uh, any uh, countries, is mostly grew by electricity demand. We'll see it right now. So this is the uh, a chart that presents the demand driving sectors for natural gas in various regions. So OECD, non-OECD, we can see that in any case, power and heat generations are on top of the uh, driving sectors. But there are already a distinction between OECD and non-OECD regarding the demand in residential sectors. As many uh, offices uh, and buildings in OECD are now hit by uh, natural gas when it's less common in non-OECD countries. If we have a look at Africa and more specifically Sub-Saharan Africa, we can see that this trend is becoming more and more visible with Africa uh, uh, in as the global consuming 60% of its natural gas for power and heat generation and even more for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So 
our methodology to collect the data with the IA, uh, uh, with our method, in our methodology, uh, tries to cover all stage of its supply side. So firstly, we focus on the production of natural gas. Again, we'll talk about this in a few slides, but we focus on the domestic uh, and uh, marketable production here. And we see from other sources, this can be gases from an oil feed or some gases coming from um, uh, a coal mine, for example. Uh, natural gas is mainly produced by sweating a mixture of methane from the underwater deposits and also a small share of gas blended into the natural gas grid that come from oil, coal, or renewables. We also cover in our methodology the, the infrastructure that connect productions with consumption. So this includes the transmission pipeline systems, the distribution systems, and some LNG, uh, the LNG terminals in the country. Finally, at the end of the chain, natural gas is consumed in different sectors such as the heat, heat and electricity generation in power plants, or water and space, space heating for production in the residential and commercial sectors. Another very important part of the supply chain is the trade. Natural gas can be imported and exported through pipeline and liquefied, and or liquefied. Now the arrow, that, will, uh, that appears represent the interaction of the flow with the infrastructures. All the natural gas produced or imported by pipelines are mixed in the transmission systems and the imports of LNG are regasified and then mixed. Some big power plants may be located right to or right next to an LNG terminal and sorts directly from the regasification process. From the transmission system, it goes to the distribution network which has a lower pressure. Most of the small and medium natural gas consumers are connected to this grid, which explains the importance for us to have a clear and precise data collections on the trade of natural gas, to know which part has been imported as energy or as uh, gas through pipelines. Now let's discuss again on the production of natural gas. As a reminder, in our methodology, we measure the productions once the products are in marketable state. This is once we have subtracted all the impurities and su subtracted the quantities of natural gas flared or re-injected. Re-injected quantities often occur in an oil field with associated natural gas. They are re-injected to favorize more commercialable products and to keep the pressure within the field. Also, keeping, uh, keeping threats of uh, re-injected quantities is not mandatory. We uh, encourage countries to keep track of those values and especially of the flared gas, which are important for, uh, for the CO2 accountability of a country. They represent a large part of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. So we have here uh, an extraction point. It can be an oil field, a gas field, a coal mine. And from it, we have the gross productions. This gross production, part of it will be flared, as I told you, or re-injected. And then the rest goes through the natural gas processing in which we extract the impurities, so sulfur, so sulfur and other elements, and also natural gas liquids, NGLs, that will be found later in our oil statistics. Please refer to the previous part. And out of this processing, we will have the market productions of associated gas, non-associated gas, purely gas, and uh, this is the reported quantity on which we focus later on in our statistics. Again, in, our stat in any statistics work, the units and physical, uh, and especially here, the physical conditions in which the measure is made are important. Natural gas being a gas, the pressure and temperature at which you are doing the measure of volumes, 
will impact the results of the uh, of your measure and it's important that those points are made in a clear uh, are clear in your data sets as i told you before regarding natural gas reporting most of the difficulties comes actually from the trade data import should cover should cover gas entering your countries for domestic consumption and reported under the, the country where the gas was produced. So import, for example, from uh, Nigeria would be classified so in such way. Export should be domestically produced, so we for N, uh, the only quantity leaving the country should be reported under export. To say it in another way, we focus on the ultimate origin or destinations of the gas, and we do not include in our data statistics the transit and re-export of natural gas. Now, if we talk a little bit about transformations, natural gas can be used in several ways to be transformed into all another uh, energy form. So the most obvious is uh, the electricity, are the electricity and or heat plants, so to produce electricity and heat. But it can also be used in uh, some coal uh, processes for in mixed with other elements in coke ovens, gas furnaces, or gas works plants uh, to generate several gases that will be burned to sustain the activities of those industrial activities. And finally, it can be used in a gas to liquid plants to generate some synthetic oil uh, products. We will not go too much in deep here, but keep in mind that this exists and can, could be reported in some of the data you encounter. So now we are done with natural gas and we will move on toward coal statistics. Now we will talk briefly about coal and coal products. Regarding uh, coals, the key trends are, of course, located in Asia with China and India. China is the world's largest producer of coal, followed uh, closely by India. And those two uh, countries use a large part of coal because of its abundance, cheap costs, and low technology barriers that allow a quick generations of electricity and support for uh, industrial activities, such as iron and steel productions and cement manufacturers, for example. Coal has some environmental con concern linked to, to its both activities because it is the largest CO2 MA emissions per unit of energy burned among conventional fuel. But it's not that uh, of uh, fuel from the past because it has, the, it has some development possibilities such as carbon captures and storage and could still have some years in the future of being consumed. Now, if we have a look at the classification in our methodology, there are several ways because of historical and scientific reasons of classifying uh, coal. In our methodology, we, uh, we try to do it by quality of the coal. So you would have here hard coal or brown coal describing their physical aspect. And from that, we would have this difference between cooking coal, anthracite, other bituminous coal and subbituminous coal, and lignite. The uh, distinction being made with their calorific value, the amount of energy that they, con that they contained and the amount of carbon uh, of carbon within their, their physical constituents. Another way to distinguish is to see through their usage. For example, cooking coal is sometimes referred as metallurgical coal because it's used mostly in iron and steel industries and anthracite bit and between the coal will be used mostly in electricity and heat generations or residential uh, smaller activities and will be referred as steam cold 
because of its use in generators. Lignite, it's still the, uh, usually excluded from this kind of uh, classifications. One important element here to keep in mind when you talk about the coal uh, statistics are that uh, terrific value may vary depending on the flows you are uh, checking in your st statistics. For example, the terrific value in your productions might not be the same as the one used in your consumption in electricity and heat generations because of selection of specific coal quality for specific consumption and the mix with the trade uh, of those products. So if we check now uh, those five uh, type of coal that we discussed in the previous sl slide are what we call also primary coal. So fossil fuel extracted from a mine and made of uh, carbonized vegetal matters under the form of a rock. But it is not the only uh, part, the only product that we cover in coal. We have also derived fuel, such as we had secondary oil products, which can, we can have some uh, derived solid products from activities such as uh, coal tar, uh, cocoa burn coke, or patent fuels, and also some manufactured gases that are the outputs, some of the outputs of activities in metallurgical. Uh, in the metallurgical sectors, for example. As I told you before, it, the weighted average for, uh, for terrific values are important to be made when you are working on, uh, on coal because of the real variation you can encounter depending on the source of the uh, coal you are checking right now. So here is a little example of a calculation in a country that use a mix of calorific value of coal coming from three other countries. And if we do the calculation of the weighted average, so as a reminder, you multiply the calorific value by the quantity, the respective quantity consumed, and you sum those uh, elements and divide them by the total quantity consumed, you obtain the average net terrific value that you will be used for your total coal consumptions reported in your energy statistics. This can apply, of course, to any other energy community that you will be using in your data sets. One last part on terrific value. As I told you, we expect it to vary depending on the flows of consumptions. But of course, it is not the only way, uh, it is not, we do not expect it to vary in a crazy, very large way. We expect for each product, the tariff value to be within specific range of uh, value. So for example, cooking coal, we expect it between 25,000 and 33,000 kilojoules per kilogram. And also, depending on uh, which products, we would expect the variation between the NCV and the GCV to be around 5 or 10%. So this slide is available uh, right now, so please don't hesitate to refer to it if you have adopts on, if you have adopts on the value you obtained for specific uh, products that you would encounter. The code balance, when we present it, is actually the most the easiest to represent uh, in terms of uh, difference between the supply and the demand. So supply, we have the domestic production from biosources, trade and stocks variations, and all these, those elements represent the supply of uh, coal. And on the demand, you would have the transformations, we see that just after, the energy industry on use, and the total final consumptions. Don't forget that due to the way uh, coal is transported, most of the time by trucks, there can be losses that are, import, uh, are important. So don't forget to keep track of those distribution losses to keep your statistics in a good way. Coal balance, so we told, uh, as I told you, we talked now about, and finally about transformations. It's actually the same almost setup as for natural gas. So you would have uh, coal to consume in electricity and heat plants. 
to generate those two uh, energy commodities. And then you will have the consumption of coal within uh, uh, various industries at the industries, such as coke ovens to, generate, to create coke oven coke. Those products being used in blast furnace for metallurgical uh, activities. And finally, you can have some coal used in gas works to generate gas workers and gas coke. One last part, again, this is in Africa only used in South Africa, but good to remember about it. You can use coke oven coke to, in liquefaction plants to generate some synthetic oil products. So not used in many countries, but still good to keep that in mind if you see uh, the term of synthetic crude oil, it can be coming from coal products. This is all that we will cover in uh, coal for, for Africa. And now we turn to renewables statistics. Before we, uh, we look at renewables and electricity, uh, we'll make a pause here and, um, and see if you have any questions. So please let us know. Uh, in the Q&A box, or you can also raise your hand and take the floor, and Taylor and I will be happy to reply to any question, doubts that you might have on, um, on the free fuel, so oil, natural gas, and coal. Don't hesitate to, to ask questions. Uh, No questions, everything was clear on the different uh, products. Let me see if I don't see any raised hands. Uh, I see a raised hand now. Who is it? Fabrice. Uh, hello, Fabrice. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, for sure. That's my hand. I wanted to ask a question uh, <laughs> uh, regarding uh, this uh, presentation, but also uh, looking back to yesterday's presentation uh, when yes. we when we were presented uh, the uh, the, the energy balances for Rwanda. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I saw somewhere a uh, call, and uh, yeah, that um, I, I would like to uh, ask you to elaborate a, a little bit more on uh, how, um, yeah, on how comes uh, we, 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 we are having a call in our energy balance. Thank you. Uh, you mean in the case for Rwanda, uh, how did we, where did we get the data for coal? Sure. Um, I need to check that. Let me, so yesterday when Mark um, presented, let me open the presentation of yesterday. So he said that for coal, this was coming from the United Nations. So the information from coal, and it was not submitted to us by, um, by the national authorities of Rwanda. Uh, ta -ta -ta. And I need to check what is, which coal product are we referring to? If other people have questions, please don't hesitate to send it to us while we are checking the Rwanda balance at the same time. So I'm opening the file now of how we process Rwanda. It's taking some time. Yes. 
because uh, do you have information on call yourself or are you just um, curious about this call in Rwanda? Uh, the point of uh, me asking was, uh, it came out of uh, curiosity because uh, I wanted to uh, specifically know uh, what would be uh, the specific uh, yeah. call products that yeah were referred to yeah i can tell it's out of curiosity yep. mm -hmm. no that's good uh, so which call product do i see here so it's not anthracite it's uh, there's a little bit of bituminous coal but mostly for historical year. Uh, it's sub bituminous coal. So, yeah, let me check again. Yeah, sub bituminous coal, some peat as well. So, peat and sub bituminous coal. And that's all. So, it's not hard coal, there's no anthracite. Um, there's very little bituminous coal in historical years, but for 2020 and 2019, I did not, I don't see anything. I see some sub bituminous coal, um, which is imported and then used in industry for non metallic minerals, so for cement. It's that it's that uh, non-metallic minerals, Tera, it's for cement, right? Uh, and then uh, no lignite and the peat is used for electricity generation. Yeah. So sub-bituminous coal, two coal products, sub-bituminous coal used in industry and uh, peat used for electricity generation. That's the only thing I see in our database now. And all this uh, as stuff. A, yes. Yeah, I I just uh, wanted to ask. Uh, we were told that the the report is forthcoming. So is it going to be some elaboration on the uh, or, or on the metadata within the report? <coughs> you mean the data that we publish at the IE? Yeah. Yes, usually when we publish data, we have some country notes where we specify for 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 the high level products. So we will for coal, we will just say for coal our source is uh, United Nations for oil. This it's not very detailed. For more detailed information, it's better that um uh, you contact us privately. Um so you can write to to Taylor's team. I'll put it in the chat box. It's wed at IEA.org. So this is the team that um, processes um, all the non-member countries, uh, non-IEA member countries data. And, uh, and so then the person who deals with Rwanda, so in this case, it's going to be Mark Casanovas, the, the person who yesterday joined, then he will send you like more detailed country note. But what we publish online, um, it's a bit high level. You do have information, uh, but you know it's it's a few paragraphs only, and I don't think we go in the detail of uh, of peat and uh, sub bituminous coal and where it is used and all. So this, I think, it's more like a bilateral discussion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for sure, uh, we do understand. Uh, the, the complexity of going into those uh, specific details for uh, all countries and uh, yeah yeah so we we keep yeah. like we list all the sources all the sources mm. are mentioned and high level by products i think we do put some information when we are making estimates uh but for detail like what i just mentioned i think this is more like uh, uh when the, we discuss between us and when we get queries then yes we give we do provide this information so 
but but this is something as yesterday mark mentioned we are getting this information from the united nations and if um, we can get more official information on coal uh, this is very much welcome and i see a, a question in the q a box uh, from martin he says i presume the coal referred to our imports used by simewa for cement making so yes so martin you were right so part of it, not everything. So the sub-bituminous coal, um, as I just uh, mentioned, it's imported and used to make cement. And then you also have some peat that is used uh, for electricity generation that you need to add to that coal. Uh, any other question? Uh, let me see if we have some other raised hands. Please don't hesitate to to take the floor in case you you want to raise some questions live. Then, if we don't have any more question, I think we can. Um, Oops, I don't know, something is happening. Um, then we can move uh, with, the, with the presentation. I'll just share again the presentation. Can you see the presentation well? Taylor? Uh, yes, I can see where you left off. So now we will talk about renewables in our energy statistics. So when we uh, talk about renewables, for example, here in the total energy supply, we can see that uh, it represents global a little bit less than 40% of the total energy supply in the world. When we say renewables, this includes hydroelectricity and solar, wind, geotherm geothermal energy, and also biofuel and waste, which represent a large part of both uh, renewables present within the total energy supply. If we look in more detail, uh, we can see that uh, almost two thirds of renewables in our statistics are made of both biofuel and waste, and more specifically of solid biofuel and charcoal. Hydro represents the first element of uh, electricity generation from uh, renewable so sources in our statistics. And it is present in a large part in the world electricity productions, which uh, represent almost 15% represent about 15 per 15 of the electricity generated in the world. Renewable sources are the uh, energy communities that have the largest and most important growth rates in the world. Between 1990 and 2018, solar PV gained 36.5% of uh, in productions, followed by wind, biogas, solar thermal, and liquid biofuels, which led to the total renewables to grow of 2%, which is more than the global total energy supply growth in the same period. Now we we'll focus a little bit more on the biofuel part, which are, as we said before, important in Africa. So here is a reminder of the previous slide we showed the, uh, before. So in sub-Saharan Africa, around 75% of total energy consumption is made of biofuel and mostly traditional biomass. This, is, uh, this has implications on health, on social ma uh, life, and also on the environment uh, of, those, uh, of those countries because of deforestation and maintenance of the area for the populations. And if we have a look, we can see that this, on those primary, uh, on those, on those uh, biofuels, 
a large part, 93%, is made of primary solid biofuel, and the lesser part, or around 7%, of charcoal. Now it's time for us to dive a little bit deeper on how we classify renewables, because for now we have talked about a lot of different uh, products. Renewables and waste can be classified into four different groups. The first one will be the renewable electricity, ener renewable energy, which have primary energy form of only electricity. This includes, of course, hydro, wind, tide, wave, and ocean electricity generation, and solar photovoltaic or solar PV. So in here, the first point of measurement for the statistics is the electricity produced from those uh, plants and structures. The second part would be the, reno uh, the renewable energy, which can produce both heat and electricity, which have a primary energy form of heat. This is composed of geothermal and solar thermal. And in that case, the first point of measurement would be the heat collected by the geothermal plant or the solar thermal, uh, thermal uh, panel. And then from this, we will see the electricity generated. The third part will be the combustible fuels, which can be stocks or trade. So those are industrial waste, municipal waste, solid biofuel, biogases, and liquid biofuels. So they are treated such as uh, uh, the, in the case of fossil fuel, let's say coal, for example, or uh, oil products. So the, their quantities, their mass being used as a unit of measurement. And lastly, there is a non-combustible heat only group which contain only heat pumps. Heat pumps. This will not be covered in too much deeply in here because it's not that uh, presence in uh, on the African continent. So now let's see about solid biofuels to dive a little bit deeper on those uh, important elements in Africa. We focus as a reminder for solid biofuel only on the fuel produced for energy purpose. So it is a small part of the total, for example, wood that would be cut in a year. Um, we also do the distinctions between uh, primary and secondary fuel following what is recommended in the IRS. So primary production is uh, the capture or extraction of the fuel of an energy form from natural energy flows from the biospheres, and uh, those are only include the co commercialable, marketable productions. The secondary production is a manufacturer of energy production through the process of transformations of other fuel or energy, whether primary or uh, secondary. So now that this distinction is made, let's see example of solid biofuel that we can encounter. So you would have bagasse, which are a byproduct of the sugar industry, and same for other uh, agronomic uh, uh, industries, you could have rice husk, olive cake, industrial waste is in a renewable form, for example, the natural rubbers. You have then wood pellets and animal waste, black liquor, liquor that, are, that is a black, uh, by, by products of paper industries, and of course, wood and woody materials, firewood, wood chips, sawdust, etc. And finally, one element in which we will dive a little bit deeper, charcoal, which is a product produced from wood products at the origin. So if, you if we follow the biofuel transformation for charcoal productions, uh, unlike the other transformation of combustible fuel, the transformation of wood to charcoal is uh, covered by many international organizations to read and try to uh, know more about it. The production of charcoal is an output of a transformation process where wood is considered the input. The losses from this are included in the transformation sectors and are checked by calculating the efficiency of the, pro of the process. Hence, the importance to have a, some net calorific value for wood and for the charcoal products so that we can have a clear uh, view on the efficiency of these transformations. So, as before, we can see that wood is input is input into the charcoal kiln, 
So here you have two examples of kin that uh, can be found uh, in the world. And the output is the charcoal. So important facts about the charcoal production, the efficiency, of course, is the input divided by the, uh, the output divided by the input in energy units. We focus here on the energy content. So the reference NCV or charcoal that we use in our statistics is 30,800 kilojoule per kilograms. And the charcoal kin efficiency that we usually expect is between 10 to uh, 40%. In, um, in reality, we see efficiencies in our data set that goes from 20 to 70%. And this is an ongoing work to try to improve the data collection on those transformations so that we can have more sensible uh, data in the end. Now we will see about the electricity uh, statistics. So first of all, Let's see some electricity trends. And what can be said about electricity demand and of course then production has grown a lot in the last uh, 20 years, mostly due to the increased level of uh, incomes from various regions such as uh, Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So the production, global production in 2018 was 26, uh, more than 26,000 uh, terawatt hours, which is equivalent on, of 4.5 million wind turbines in the world. And Sub-Saharan Africa witnessed a threefold increase faster than the rest of the African continent. So, we can see that uh, electricity can be generated from various other uh, sources, such as solar, hydro, nuclear, or fossil fuel, gas, oil, and coal. If we look at the share of each of those sources for electricity generation, we can see that uh, depending on the region you are looking at, the origin of electricity will be really different. For example, in the case of OECD, it's more or less spread between coal, gas, and nuclear. And uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, we see that hydro represents a large majority of the uh, generations followed closely by gas. Electricity generation mix is highly dependent on the most available and cheapest sources, as well as political choices and incentives in a determined country or regions. So if we look, for example, at the difference between the share of solar uh, generations in OECD or in Sub-Saharan Africa, we can see here difference in terms of access to the technology and political decisions made in various countries. Now, here are examples of uh, those electricity meets in different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And obviously, it's really dependent on the political choice of choices of one country and the availability within the border of the country. So now let's have a closer look at the electricity consumption by sectors to see where it is mostly uh, consumed. In non-OECD uh, countries in general, it's mostly consumed in industries. This is mostly due to the prominence of China and uh, India uh, data within uh, those, those countries. But in, sub in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, we see that this uh, share is mostly, this first place is mostly occupied by uh, residential and in a lesser way, by industries in terms of uh, consumptions. So now let's have a look at uh, residential electricity demand, since it was that important in, uh, in the previous slide. So the increase in wealth drives higher consumption per capita and the uh, then allows more people to have access to electricity in those countries. And 
This is a feedback loop. More, the more access led to an increase in wealth, etc., etc. So we can see in several uh, countries between 2010 and 2019, for example, here we can see Ethiopia, but with the access uh, growing for, those, uh, for the population, we have an increase of the GDP uh, within the country. So both uh, elements are connected in our data sets. Now let's talk a little bit more about the data themselves. So how do we represent uh, a tricky issue but, uh, that are uh, electricity and heat data sets? In terms of supply, we collect the fuel inputs to electricity and heat generations. So the quantity of coal or natural gas burned to generate electricity. From this, we obtain the gross productions, the N, we subtract to that the own use by the electricity plant to obtain the net production. In addition to uh, those various elements, one can extract from the production the pumped storage hydro in some specific hydro plants, uh, the, the water are pumped back to play the role of stocks of, possi of possible energy sources and some more detailed uh, elements that are not that present in, on the African continent, which are electric boilers and heat pumps. Then we have the trade, so import and export of electricity. They are specific in the case of specific, specific rules in case of electricity. We will see them a little bit later. And also an important part, which are the losses in transmission and distributions uh, of the, this electricity. This uh, precise element can be uh, high in case of old or badly maintained uh, transmission and distribution systems, but also due to theft of electricity. At the end of the chain, for the demand, we would have the final consumption of electricity uh, for residential uh, industries, etc. In addition to all those elements in the, that will be in either physical units for the fuel inputs or in gigawatt hours, one can collect also the peak load and the capacity of this electric, electric system, which are very good indicators to be used later on on the uh, development of the country. So firstly, let's look at sources of electricity to see how we distinguish uh, the possible sources. Electricity is produced as both primary and secondary energy commodity. Primary electricity is obtained from natural sources such as hydro, solar photovoltaic, wind, tidal or wave energy, for example. Secondary sources uh, are obtained from the heat generated by burning a combustible fuel. So either uh, fossil fuel, coal, oil, gas, or oil, etc., or also from nuclear fission, from geothermal energy, and from solar thermal heat. So this is the first distinction that you can find in the data set when we talk about primary electricity and secondary electricity. Now also some distinctions we can do in the electricity data are the type of producers. You can have main activity producers, which uh, for, for whom the uh, generations and of electricity or heat and the sale of this uh, production to third party is their primary activities. So most of the time, those are plants like nuclear plants, uh, thermal plants, uh, natural gas electricity plants, but for which the sole objective is to sell this uh, electric uh, or heat generated. And then we have the auto producers. Auto producers generate electricity and heat as a second uh, or byproduct of their own activities. Uh, let's say, for example, a windmill that will uh, generate a little bit of electricity from its activity, it can so sell this electricity to the grid uh, without uh, this being its main source of incomes. 
Now, another distinction in a type of plants will be the type of energy that is produced at the end of it. So you have electricity only, heat only, or combined heat and electricity, which is also referred as CHP, combined heat and power. Now that we have seen the uh, distinctions we can do in the data, let's talk again about efficiencies. So we, if we insist on this in this function, it's because efficiencies are important to keep good track of your data sets and check the quality of your data set. And again, an efficiency is calculated by the output divided by the input in net, uh, using net coefficient value for the to, have, to work on energy units. And in energy units, it's always below 100%. The efficiency will differ by fuel or technologies. And once again, you must calculate your efficiency in energy unit uh, every time you can. So for example, an input of 100 units into a power plant would have an output of 20 units plus 45 units uh, of 20 units of electricity plus 45 units of heat. And if you calculate the, the efficiency, considering it's all in the same unit, you have a 65% 60, efficiency. The rest, the 45 units lost, are what we call the heat loss and uh, are part of any transformations to, from one form of energy to another. So just a reminder, use the same energy units everywhere, hence the importance in energy balance as you've seen in other presentations of picking the correct energy unit. Now let's go back a little bit uh, when we were discussing about capacities. In addition to production, consumption and trade data, we try also to capture in our data uh, the power plant capacities, specifically the net maximum capacity. Net maximum capacity is simply the maximum power output that a power plant can produce will, uh, with all plants running at full blast. And we consider from a further vision that we capture this on the 31st December of the reporting year. These are useful data for analysts to have. However, they can also be useful for statisticians when checking the data as we can compare to compare actual reported production value with the maximum potential production values to check if the data made sense. This value, actual production divided by potential production, is called the capacity factors. So as you can see, capacity factors is actual production divided by capacity times the time of a, of a year, in that case, or in any other time your friend you are working here. Again, this value should always be less than 100%, except if there were plants closure near the end of the year, in which case the figure may be distorted. And there are different expected values depending on the technology. For instance, nuclear plants are expensive to build and therefore are typically run as much as possible, whereas solar PV, which does not run at night, and is both weather and location dependent, will have a lower capacity factors. So as statistician, we can use both historical and expected capacity factor as a check in our data. Now, we, let's talk again another, uh, on the concept between gross and net productions. Gross production refers to the total output of electricity or heat generated in a facility before any uses. However, not all of this is, this is used for productive purpose beyond the power plants. Some of the electricity and heat generated is used on site at the power plant for lighting, heating, and to support plant operations. This is referred to as on use. The remainder that is left after substrating the on use is the net. Uh, production. However, remember that for auto producers, production only refers to the heat sold, heat or electricity sold to, uh, to the grid, which brings to the uh, 
which bring to this kind of uh, which bring us to a final check that you can do regarding the old news that we expect it should not vary too much over time and stay around 5%. So as I told you in a previous slide, you, you have also a value expected, which is the transmission and distribution losses. Uh, so let's see a little bit more what's happening in uh, the various uh, uh, part of this, of those losses. As electricity travels through cables and transformers, energy is lost along the way. Much of this is in the form of heat as the electric current flowing through the cable raises its, its temperature. This energy is lost as it, it dissipates into the surroundings, reducing the amount of energy that reaches the final destinations. In general, losses can be expected to be in the range about 5 to 15 per percent. With loss losses on the lower end of the scale observed in more advanced, compact, and well-maintained grid, and higher losses observed in older or more distributed grid, and where there is a high rate of meter bypassing, in other words, theft of electricity. Now, let's see uh, to finish on trade for electricity, as I told you, there are specific rules regarding trade of electricity. Unlike other fuels, trade of electricity and heat are more difficult to understand because uh, they are not physical units that you can move by yourself. It's a flow of electrons through a cable. So how do you uh, report this? Uh, well, you report it as a flow, actually like a fl flow through, going through borders of a country. And in that case, we do not focus on the origin and destinations of these uh, those electrons. Let's take an example to see it a little bit more clearly. Here we have three countries, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria. So let's imagine that Togo is importing electricity from Nigeria through the network of Benin. Those three countries would have to report the, the flows as, uh, as it follows. Nigeria would report exportations toward Benin. Benin would report in some importation from Nigeria and the same value exported towards Togo. And Togo would, re would report the uh, importation from Benin. So here, for electricity, this is the only part where, in our methodology, we report the uh, transit of flows. Now, we will briefly discuss on the possible electricity data sources for your data collections. So, very briefly, we already discussed about it before. You can use surveys toward power production, toward uh, enterprise, households, or market or operators to collect from them on a regular basis, basis uh, data on value of production or consumptions. You can use, use administrative data from energy regulators, customs office for the trades, and data treating from program policy implementations to check the efficiency of specific uh, policies. You can use direct measurements, so using conventional or smart meters to directly measure on a building or on a specific place, the consumption on the regular points. And finally, you can use estimation and modeling, for example, using the plant capacity information to estimate uh, generations of a specific sources. With this, we reach the end of this presentation. So the IEA have a lot of resources available online. So some free products, such as the keyword and statistics, data and statistics browser, and uh, energy atlas manuals to on the energy statistics uh, re, uh, methodologies. And uh, we, are, we have also a lot of various ener energy data 
on specific flows on CO2 emissions and or any other price. Now, this is the end of this piece. So I hope that everything was clear for this uh, presentation on renewables and electricity. Again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, we have someone, so Martin raised his hand. <coughs> Hi, Martin. Hi, Zakia, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my my question, my qu I just needed more clarification on how you 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 calculate or you define the imports in the example that the presenter gave uh, with regards to um, where you have more than two countries or transition trans trans power transiting from one country to another. Uh, yeah, uh, Taylor, would you like to take this one? Sure. So uh, specifically for electricity, uh, the convention is you're looking at the borders crossed as opposed to, um, let's say, if one country is selling to another. So, um, uh, for instance, uh, so we cannot we would not expect to see any trade between countries that don't share a border. Uh, is, is that um, so, clear? So, so in, in, for example, if Rwanda is importing uh, electricity from, uh, let's say, Ethiopia and it has to pass through Kenya and uh, Uganda. Uh, in that case, you would only report trade from the country whose um, from border Uganda. is crossing. Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's clear. Uh, Zaki, you're, Zaki, you're muted. Yeah, I was saying that Kenya would not be reporting um, exports to Rwanda, but only to the first country, uh, uh, the first border. And Rwanda will be reporting imports from, uh, from the last one, from yeah. the border one. But that's only for electricity. If it was, for example, oil, then oil would have been Kenya to Rwanda oh. directly. That was a good question. Um, any other question from colleagues? I think for electricity, uh, I don't think in Rwanda you have some heat, but also taking into account the fact that for heat, it's only the amount of heat that is sold uh, is an important concept. Um, please let us know if you have any other question. No question, everything was clear. <laughs> uh, then in this case, uh, let's do some Menti. I forgot to do this one uh, before the, the second presentation. So I will share again my screen. Okay. So uh, it's the same. Uh, code as earlier. So please connect to www.menti.com and use the code 74, 49, 76, and 20. And I think here we will be able to test if uh, you have understood well uh, everything that was explained in the presentations. So please connect to Menti and use the code that appears up on the screen, 74, 49, 76, and 20. 
And the first question is, what are natural gas liquids? Is it the same as LNG? So it is natural gas liquids the same as natural gas in a different form? Is it a waste product extracted from natural gas purification and of no value? Or is it a mix of gases different from natural gas and more similar to oil products? Or is it something else? So what are natural gas liquids? So this was mentioned uh, in, uh, in the presentation. Mm -hmm. So we have four answers, two that replied the first one and two that replied the second one. So let's look at the right answer. And the right answer is that natural gas liquids, it's a mix of gases different from natural gas and more similar to oil products. And, uh, and at the IA, we report NGLs uh, with, with oil and it's aggregated with oil. And LNG, it's, uh, it's, it's different from natural gas liquids. Uh, it's just natural gas in a liquefied form. So LNG, it's reported with natural gas. <coughs> it's the same thing. It's natural gas in a liquefied form. And NGLs, it's more close to oil. <coughs> Sorry about this. <coughs> Next question. Uh, what is the renewable energy source that witnessed the highest growth since 1990? <coughs> so you have uh, five possible answers. What's the renewable energy source that has increased the highest since 1990? <clears throat> Is it wind, solar PV, liquid biofuels, biogases, or geothermal? So we have one participant that replied liquid biofuels. Another one that is saying, two that's saying solar PV. have now free that's saying solar PV. So what do you think? Let's look at the right answer and the right answer is indeed solar PV. So excellent for those who replied right. Next question. For from an energy statistics point of view, what are the other uses of wood besides charcoal production? Is it as a raw material for the, for the production of furnitures, as a combustible for cooking and space heating, or none of these? So here, what's important is from an energy statistics point of view. What are the other uses of wood? So we have two participants that saying as a combustible for cooking and space heating. Five now. Very good. So that's right. So in an energy statistics or balances, we only report wood use for energy purposes. So in this case for cooking and space heating, and if you're making a table with the wood, then this you should not report that in your energy balance, that amount of wood. Next question, which sector consumes the most electricity globally? 
Is it the residential, industry, services, or transport sector? So at the world level, which sector consumes the most electricity? So we have three participants that think it is the industry sector. Oh no. So which sector consumes the most electricity globally? Let's look at the right answer. Excellent, everyone got it right. So we had six participants that replied industry and um, it's followed very closely by transport sector. Next question, it's the same question, but in this case for Sub-Saharan Africa. So which sector consumes the most electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa? So at the world level, we see that the industry sector consumes the most electricity but what about Sub-Saharan Africa? <coughs> so the answers are a bit uh, varied, but we have more people that saying that it's the residential household. So what do you think is Sub-Saharan Africa following the same trend as globally or is it different? So let's look at the right answer and the right answer is uh, the residential sector. So it's different from global. And I think that was the last question. So now, we will look at the exercise. So I'm sharing again my screen. I hope that it's big enough for you. So um, I don't know how many of you got uh, the chance to, to go on the Google Drive link and, and to, to see how this exercise looks like and maybe try to do it. But uh, we'll, look, um, we'll do it together now. And if you have time, I really recommend you to try to do it by yourself. And if you have some questions or some doubts, write to me uh, directly by email. And then we can also exchange and see if, um, if there's anything more to clarify. So the first, this first exercise, it's um, here you are asked to study the efficiency of electricity generation in country A from natural gas as a new plant project is being discussed and you receive this energy statistics sheet from the ministry to help you with this task. So you receive here in blue the, uh, the statistics for country A for natural gas and this is in a million million cubic meters so that's the physical unit. You have data for production, import, exports, total supply, the statistical difference, the electricity plants, so how much goes to produce electricity, also some total final consumption in industry, residential and other, and you have your total demand, and you have data from 2010 to 2090. So you have all this information in blue for gas. And then, here for question one, you are asked using the gross calorific value for natural gas production and imports, calculate the weighted average gross calorific value for production and imports uh, from 2013 to 2019. So here in green, you are provided with the natural gas gross calorific value. So for production for, and for imports, and then you're provided, you're asked to calculate the weighted average gross calorific value for the highlighted cells in yellow here. So from 13 to 19. So for production, we know that it's 38 uh, megajoule per cubic meter. 
For imports, you, it varies a bit every year. And now you have to calculate your weighted. So how do we calculate the weighted average is that you do uh, in Excel, you can use um, the formula sum product, but uh, it's the same as you take your production amount. So you take nine, nine times 38 plus 150 times your import GCV, 41.5, divided by nine plus 150. And that will give you your weighted average uh, calorific value which is 41.3, and you apply the same formula up to 2019. So for 2019, I'll say again, the formula, it's 100, 123 times 38 plus 112 times 40.1 divided by your total of production and imports, and that gives you 39. So, um, so what do we notice here? Uh, we see that in 2013, the natural gas production is very low. So it's only nine, whereas nine million cubic meters, whereas you're importing much more, 150 million cubic meters. So your weighted average calorific value, it's closer to the value of imported natural gas, so 41, uh, which makes sense. But in 2019, given that uh, both production and uh, imports, it's more or less the same, then your weighted average calorific value, it's in the middle of 38 and 40, which is, which is fine. <coughs> so the second question is, can you identify something wrong with the production uh, calori gross calorific values? Do you see any way of correcting this? So here, what do we see? We see that it's 38 every year. And this is suspicious, right? Uh, normally calorific values, they vary. And here it's fixed throughout the years. And this could be due to um, maybe the source of data uh, that is uh, using default values when reporting. And how can we solve this? First, we need to discuss with the data providers. You need uh, to ask more information. Maybe you can develop your survey even further to, to request for this type of detailed information. And sometimes you need to have a mandate to make the producing company publish this information. Sometimes if there's no mandate, then companies don't feel obliged to send you this kind of information. It's more work for them. And, and so it's always good to have some proper mandate. <coughs> Next question. Using the gross calorific values for natural gas, calculate the natural gas balance in terajoule gross calorific value, fill all the empty tables. So here we are asked to fill this table for us in energy units. So we have our table in physical unit, we have our gross calorific values, and now we want to calculate the uh, energy unit. So gross calorific value. So what do we do? It's very easy. You take your amount of production and you multiply by your uh, gross calorific value, and that gives you your amount for production. So for production, we have specific calorific value, so we use that. Same for imports. You take your imports amount, you multiply it by your imports gross calorific value, and it works. But for the others, we don't have specific gross calorific values, then we will apply the weighted one. So everywhere for exports, stock changes, uh, electricity, uh, you will apply the weighted calorific value. And for total supply, it's just the sum of everything and your total demand as well. It's the sum of electricity um, to other. So that's uh, easy. Uh, question two. So for question three, it says, using the uh, calculated balance, calculate a verification indicator for the statistical difference. So how can we check if our statistical difference is, is good, is okay? 
Um, so the way we check it is to calculate it as a share of your total supply. And usually it should be less than um, around 5%. When it's higher than 5%, we, we need to double check it. So here you calculate, so you take your statistical difference, you divide it by your total supply, and you calculate the percentage and it's minus 2% for 2010. You apply the same formula up to 2019 and you get minus four. And here, this is the next question is, observing the statistical difference verification indicator, do you see <coughs> any year for which the statistical difference suggests there is a problem with the data? What is, <coughs> what are the possible reasons? So here we see for 2015, our statistical difference is huge, minus 55%. And this is not possible. It's an indication that there's a problem in our data. And, and so here, there's two possibilities. Either our supply is, there's something wrong in the supply or there's something wrong in our demand. And if you look carefully, you can already have a hint that something is wrong in the demand side here because it increases suddenly in 2015. So let's keep it like that. We'll look at it in more details after. So we already know while we are looking at the data that there's something wrong. So we go further and now we are provided with electricity output information for the same country by fuel. So we know exactly how much Electricity is produced from coal, natural gas, from renewables. So you have your total generation and your total demand and your statistical difference. Everything is in gigawatt hour. So here it's we, for question five, it's asking us using the natural gas and the electricity generation data, as well as the conversion factor provided, calculate the electricity generation efficiency for natural gas. <coughs> so here, highlighted yellow, we need to make this calculation. So here we need to convert the input in the correct unit because here you have electricity uh, natural gas in terajoule, you have electricity in gigawatt hour. And so we, we, when you calculate efficiency, it's both in the same unit. So here, what do we do? We take our natural gas output divided by the input. So we know how much here natural gas is, goes into electricity plants in terajoule but we want to convert that terajoule into gigawatt hour using the conversion here, so 3.6. So output divided by input in the same unit and you get 30%. So this is the efficiency of the gas transformation uh, for electricity production. So you calculate this for all the years. And again here, 2015, is an issue because it's very low, we get 20%, whereas for all the other years, it's around 30, 35. So question six, do we notice an issue with any of the calculated efficiencies? Yes, there's an efficiency which is suspiciously low compared to historical figures. So what's, what's uh, probably wrong here. If we look at the natural gas output for 2015, it's a bit lower, but it, it seems okay. But it, we, we said, right, if you look at the input here, here it's increasing a lot. So you are increasing in 2015, you're increasing your natural gas input to electricity plants, but then you're having a big uh, decline uh, a lesser decline in electricity uh, output <coughs> from natural gas. So here, um, try to correct the wrongly. So the next question is, try to correct the wrongly reported figure in the statistics. So how can we fix this issue? It's uh, usually, uh, we start with the efficiency. So we know that um, electricity generation from natural gas, it's around 35%. So we will try to put this to 35%. 
So we will use a 35% efficiency. So that's the formula. So we'll try to here back calculate this, um, this input to electricity plants. So we know the output is correct. We know that we want to apply a 35% efficiency. So then we back calculate the input. So we take the output and we divide by 35% of, um, of D65. Yeah, so we, we, uh, we back calculate using a 35 efficiency and also by converting to terajoule uh, by dividing by 3.6 here. And that gives us the right input and magically, <coughs> the statistical difference uh, also goes in the right range. And given that we applied a 35% efficiency, you get your 35% here as well. And this solves uh, the problem. So here we applied a 35% efficiency range average uh, because 2014 and 2016 was 35, so the middle year, uh, we assume that it's also 35% and we re-estimated the input based on the electricity output um, uh, is correct. So that was uh, this first exercise where we look at natural gas uh, conversion from physical to energy unit, the, the use of calorific values, calculating efficiencies, how to make some checks in your data, so it covers a bit of the different notions that we have looked uh, today um, in the commodity statistics session. I hope that it was uh, useful uh, to you. Uh, please let us know if you have any question on this. Again, I think the best way to, to move forward with this exercise is really to take a look at it yourself and try to do it by yourself. And, uh, and um, regarding the recording of this session, I know that some, some of the colleagues had uh, issues uh, with internet. So uh, Marina will try to put it uh, by tomorrow on YouTube. And so you can then, uh, watch it at your ease uh, whenever needed so every for uh, all the sessions are recorded and put on youtube so you will have a playlist where everything is put regularly sometimes on the same day or the following day we try to to put everything online no questions so tomorrow uh, we will move even further and look at how to use those commodity statistics in physical units and build the energy balances. And then we will also look at how, uh, how to calculate CO2 emissions uh, with the energy balances data. So I think that you can see the flow of the different sessions. We started with the fundamentals, the basic concepts for energy statistics yesterday uh, yesterday today we look at the different uh, commodity statistics tomorrow we'll see how to build energy balances and consolidate together all these fuels in an energy unit using a common methodology then we will see how to calculate co2 emissions then next week next tuesday we will see how we can combine those energy balances data and work on other indicators. We will see the um, end user prices. We will look at energy efficiency indicators, uh, the data that we collect at the IEA. And uh, those are very important, you know, uh, additional data that, uh, that is useful when, when, uh, when working on energy especially when you're working on policies and all and also for modeling so thank you very much everyone i don't see any other question thanks jovin and uh, see you all tomorrow have a nice evening everyone bye <laughs>